Good afternoon, my name's Rosalind Dixon. I'm a Professor of Law and Director of the Gilbert and Tobin Centre of Public Law here at UNSW Sydney. On behalf of UNSW Sydney, welcome to this panel on the current crisis in uh, accountability in the Australian Parliament. We've just heard a remarkable uh, press conference from the former Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and I'm joined today by two leading constitutional experts, Professor Anne Toomey from the University of Sydney uh, and Professor George Williams, Deputy Vice-Chancellor here at UNSW. So you will have read both Anne and George uh, in the pages of leading papers and seen them in numerous media outlets over the last couple of days, but we've just heard from the Prime Minister. He says these were exceptional times and appointing himself to five ministries was necessary. Um, he said, I was responsible for everything ultimately in the minds of the Australian people, so I needed to be legally responsible. Do you agree, George? Uh, no, I don't. And uh, I certainly accept the premise that these were extraordinary times. Uh, we were and still do face a pandemic which threatens great loss of life. But we have a system of government that frankly did not require the concentration of power of this kind in the Prime Minister. We don't have a presidential system. We have a cabinet based system. That system is based upon trust and it relies upon a group of people governing the country to deal with that crisis. What we actually saw was a response that undermined the effectiveness of that system. By doubling up on jobs, by removing the proper scrutiny of Parliament, I actually think it, rather than helping, actually threatened to undermine those efforts. So I don't see it as necessary, and I think the fact that this was not done in a similar way in other points, such as World War II, World War I, is equally telling about that this actually should not have occurred. Do you agree, Anne? I mean, what would have happened if Greg Hunt or Josh Frydenberg or uh, Karen Andrews got really unwell from COVID and weren't able to exercise their ministerial responsibilities? Do you think that this was a necessary step? No, it wasn't. We, we already have systems to deal with that. And we know what happened because um, Peter Dutton became ill with COVID. And um, you can have, um, under the current system, uh, ministers to act on behalf of other ministers. This happens all the time when ministers go overseas, when ministers go on holidays, when ministers are ill. We have a system that deals with that um, and there are ways of doing it. So, for example, there's a provision in the Acts Interpretation Act, Section 34AAB, which allows one minister to authorise another minister to act on their behalf, noting that the first minister needs to know about it because they have to authorise it. Uh, we also um, have a situation where ministers who are all within the one portfolio can exercise the statutory powers of others within that portfolio. So there were no circumstances in which Australia could have been left ungoverned because particular ministers became ill. Um, and the other very bizarre thing about this is why is there an assumption that the prime minister is not going to be the one who becomes ill? I mean, frankly, if you did need to make some kind of alternative system it should have been an alternative system in which you had pools of available ministers who could fill in in the circumstances if necessary, uh, rather than relying on one human being who was just as fallible and easily able to become ill as anyone else. So if you were arguing current system doesn't sufficiently work, need a new system, you wouldn't base it on the health one of one single person, okay? You would actually do it properly. And there is a mechanism for doing it properly because you do have these portfolio ministries that have a number of ministers in them. So we do have a system where there are a pool of people who can exercise the powers of another. So and it's I just think, was unnecessary. I think, uh, I think that still then begs the question that the press conference does not answer is why was this done? Because it frankly was not needed. There were procedures, processes to enable this to happen anyway. And uh, for it to be done in this way, it just beggars belief as to actually why it occurred in the first place. And uh, perhaps it was hasty decision making in the heat of the moment. Perhaps it was just poor judgment. But that's what we still lack an explanation for as to exactly why was it done in this way, given the available alternatives. And why was it secret? I mean, that there's no explanation being given for why it had to be done in secret. So can you tell us out a bit how it works when these kinds of appointments are made? What are the mechanics in terms of something going to the Governor General requesting an appointment of this kind? OK, so ordinarily when a government itself is formed after an election, uh, it's up to the Governor General to appoint the Prime Minister and then the Prime Minister advises the Governor General on the other appointments. So normally it's direct advice from the Prime Minister to the Governor General. It doesn't go through the Executive Council because the Executive Council, of course, can't be existing at the point that a Prime Minister is appointed. 
Uh, so normally there'd be some kind of documentation going to the Governor General authorising the appointment. There may well be an explanation attached to it. In this case, because it was unusual, perhaps they attached a page saying uh, this is because of the pandemic, we're setting up this new system because of the risk involved and the Attorney General has authorised it and said that it's legal. So perhaps they did that. But because it doesn't go through the system of executive council, it receives less scrutiny, and that's obviously been problematic here. But it would still have to have gone through some level of bureaucracy in, in Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, because I'm pretty convinced that the Prime Minister himself wasn't sitting down writing the documents. So there must have been people there who knew, and the ordinary system would be to send it through to the official secretary of the Governor-General, um, who would then um, sign as appropriate um, the, the relevant document. And we know that the Governor-General has acknowledged that this happened uh, in relation to the five ministries and that it's according to ordinary process. Do you think, I mean, I've written in, in the uh, Sydney Morning Herald today saying he should have raised a red flag and asked pretty searching questions about why this was happening and how overlap was going to be dealt with. Do you agree with that? Yes and no. Um, first of all, it depends on what he knew. So we, we don't know what he knew. If it just came through as, you know, we're setting this up as an emergency measure, he is a, uh, the Attorney General has advised that it's OK. Um, he may not have known that Cabinet didn't know about it. He may not have known that the relevant minister who was being shadowed didn't know about it. Um, so we don't know what the Governor-General knew to start with. So if it was, if it seemed to be a sensible thing to be doing in the middle of a pandemic when no doubt the Governor General and others were distracted by that. I can understand that that would have happened without any pushback. And, can, and I think can I also say that the one thing we do know for sure is the Governor General made the right decision in following the advice of the Prime Minister. There is not a discretion to refuse to appoint the Prime Minister to these roles. That would have been a genuine constitutional crisis if that had occurred. So there are questions around did the Governor General warn, advise, what might have happened. but. In the end, the Governor-General does not have the discretion to refuse this, and uh, we need to keep that in mind in judging the actions of the Governor-General. So the power, the power is to ask hard questions, not to refuse, and the question is what, what process was there, what information mm. was he provided with, and then what questions did he ask on the basis of that? And I think that you know, it would be interesting to see if any of that comes to light in the coming days. It, it, it may not, but I mean, there are previous examples of where similar sorts of things happen. So let me, well, not quite as similar, but <laughs> let me just give you one example. So uh, back in the early 1970s, Sir Paul Hasluck was Governor General. Uh, he was tipped off by the Defence Minister at the time, who I think was Malcolm Fraser, uh, that the Prime Minister wanted to send Australian troops into Papua New Guinea, that the Defence Minister, mm -hmm. Fraser, didn't agree with it, and that Cabinet hadn't been consulted. So the Governor-General got tipped off in advance that, that the Prime Minister was going to come with another minister to hold an emergency admin Executive Council meeting and bounce him into making a decision without being properly informed. And because the Governor-General had been tipped off, when that did happen, he said to the Prime Minister, well, you know, Prime Minister, you might want to have a think about this. What would happen if the troops went into Papua New Guinea and there was bloodshed? You will want the support of the fact that this was decided by Cabinet. I therefore think it would be wise for you to go back and consult your Cabinet. And that's what happened. The Prime Minister went back. So Governors General themselves are not completely powerless, but their power is only one to mm. persuade. Um, uh, but they have to be aware of the circumstances to do that. And that's what I'm not sure of in this particular case. Yeah. And you can try and persuade, and it may well be that the case that the particular um, minister is just stubborn and says, no, I just want you to mm. do that. In which case, as George said, he really wouldn't have had a choice. There's no real reserve power that could be exercised here. He wasn't being asked to do something unlawful or unconstitutional. So he wouldn't have had a choice. No, the power to is to advise counsel and warn not to mm. withhold the appointment. So some people, including Barry Cassidy, have said this is 1975 all over again. You've said, and Greg Craven has said, it's the opposite. Tell us why it's the opposite. Well, it, I mean, in 1975, the criticism of the Governor-General was simply that the Governor-General hadn't um, complied with the advice of his own Prime Minister. He acted without that advice on the basis of reserve powers. Here, we've got many of the same people criticising the Governor-General for acting on the advice of the, the Prime Minister and saying, well, you shouldn't just take his advice. You should be, you know, defending the Constitution and making your own decision, etc. So there is a real contradiction in that. 
Um, but there is a, a middle point between all of this. And so a governor general does have a role of protecting the constitution, but that role is primarily one of query and persuading. You can ask for extra advice. You can delay acting. I'm, I've spoken to a number of governors general who've said that they've mm -hmm. done that, that they had delayed and said, well, I'm not going to sign it now. Go back and give me further advice and scare the living daylights out of the relevant ministers and public servants. And can I tell you, they quite enjoy doing that. <laughs> um, so that happens. And more often than you'd think, I have to say, uh, certainly more often than you know, because almost never that becomes public. Uh, so they do have that kind of role. But ultimately, where does the political power and responsibility rest? It rests with the minister. I mean, we, we, we elect these people to parliament and they form a government because they have the, um, they have the support of a majority in the lower house. And the whole issue of responsible government is that they are the ones who are responsible through the parliament to the people and they are responsible for the advice to the governor general, not the governor general. So I want to pick up this point about accountability and also the point you make about secrecy. In you know some cases, we will never know what the Governor General did, but here we would have had an expectation that we should have known who was the minister for a particular portfolio, and even more so if it was a critically important one. So George, what is the problem with this not having been communicated to Cabinet, to the relevant ministers and to the public? Well, the bottom line is uh, our democracy, our system of government depends upon transparency about these things. We need base level knowledge about who is a minister at any particular point, because without that information, key processes break down. And one of those is, of course, the role of parliament, the whole idea of responsible government, that it will scrutinise, hold to account ministers uh, for their role. And if you don't know who that minister is, it can make the job very difficult. But equally cabinet. I mean, cabinet depends upon trust within the room. It depends upon collective decision making. It depends upon knowledge as to who is holding particular portfolios. And one of the really troubling things here, of course, is that cabinet members were not aware that their own portfolio was held by the prime minister. I mean, that really strikes at the heart of the proper operation of cabinet. And you can see that from the almost visceral reactions of cabinet members who've come out afterwards, really shocked that in fact, their portfolio was also held by the Prime Minister. So that issue about transparency and secrecy has elevated this from an unwise decision that probably should never have happened into something much, lar much larger um, because the secrecy itself is what really gets to the heart of why this is a problem within our system of government. And said something lovely this morning in the Australian Financial Review, it's the cover-up that always gets you, but in this instance it was the cover-up before the fact. So I want to also pick up on this problem of blurred responsibility, Anne, in terms of what the significance is for executive decision making. You note that it does happen from time to time that there are multiple ministers in a portfolio. The Prime Minister's just told us that, you know, he's staying around, but he's happy to see reform in the future. What are the reforms that you would like to see in terms of making sure that uh, when there are these sort of forms of overlap of a much more ordinary kind, not the kind of extraordinary kind we saw here, that there's processes in terms of publicity and the legislative record to deal with them. Okay, so I think the first thing that we need is we need to make sure that every commission given to a minister is treated as a statutory instrument for the purposes of legislation and that it therefore is required to go on the Federal Register of Legislation. So it needs a formal system that they are always Publicized. And would you say the same for a delegation to another minister to act? Indeed. And so that would be helpful as well. And then the third thing is, and that was quite interesting from the from the former Prime Minister's um, press conference, he talked about charter letters. Um, so what's missing in all of this is that when you do have three or four ministers in a portfolio, at the moment there is no information that tells you which one is actually performing which functions in it and which legislation is being administered by which minister. So ultimately, at the micro level, we have this problem all the time. It's not just an issue of this weird thing with the prime minister coming in over the top with no one knowing. There is a fundamental existing problem as it is that it's impossible to find out which minister exercises particular powers under particular acts. And so that needs to be made public as well. And if we can get some reform to clear up those issues, 
and make sure all of that information is available to the public, then we clear up a lot of the transparency issues because every Australian should have the right to know what powers are able to be exercised by the ministers who represent them. Well, the only decision that we're aware of that the Prime Minister made under this arrangement was a decision to override his resources minister in relation to a major gas project and the minister responsible uh, or thought he was responsible, said, I stand by all my decisions. But of course, it wasn't ultimately his decision. George, do you think that ultimate exercise of power stacks up with the explanation that this were uh, COVID-related extraordinary measures for extraordinary times? Look, no, and that example clearly doesn't bear that out. But also, you've got to ask if it was COVID-related, why this selection of ministries, why the particular timings the timing. in place? Um, there's a lot here that just doesn't bear up to close scrutiny. And uh, perhaps, again, it was just a series of bad decisions, ill-thought-out actions. But to suggest that it's a calculated and careful response to COVID, I don't think is it does stack up. The other thing is, is when you put it in the larger context, which at this point, Australians are fearful about the powers being exercised by their government, a lack of trust we're seeing emerging in many places, claims that government is operating in secrecy, conspiracy theories mm. emerging, oh, yes. this feeds it. I mean, this is really problematic because this is exactly the sort of thing that gives credence to some of those arguments that things were happening for which the parliament was not informed and that you're right to question and not trust that people are exercising these truly extraordinary powers on our behalf. And we've got to remember that the, the key one of these was the health minister's powers under the Biosecurity Act, which are the most extraordinary powers on the statute book. And the fact that they could have been exercised by the prime minister is really troubling, given the extent of those powers. And if it was a COVID related response, the first thing you do is say, we've done this for this reason, we need to do it to protect the community. We're taking these steps. But the secrecy, again, it undermines the rationale because it actually is more problematic and uh, is likely to excite even more concern. And of course, Greg Hunt may have been the only minister in those, that arrangement who was properly informed, but the public also had a right uh, to know. I mean, is this consistent with a broader pattern that we saw the government centralising power and particularly Morrison seeing himself as a kind of quasi president who made a lot of the decisions both in terms of how he dealt with the states and um, cabinet more broadly during the pandemic? Well, I think it certainly cuts across a lot of pretty basic assumptions about how we are governed in this country. And one is that, yes, there's a minimum level of transparency about who is a minister. And if you'd asked me a few days ago, I, I would have said, Anne, we probably don't need some of the things you've suggested, but I've had to change my mind because, in fact, those assumptions have been challenged. And we do live in a world, you look to the US, the UK and other places where basic assumptions are being challenged, that people are willing to run against the grain in, in troubling ways. But what we also saw during the pandemic was this enormous growth of executive power. Um, we saw many decisions made that did not have parliamentary scrutiny. In fact, disallowance by parliament was very often removed for key decisions. And this may be a reflection of that as well, that as the prime minister said, it was me. Um, I was responsible, only I understood. But in fact, that's a problem because no, that's not our system of government. Parliament must be involved, cabinet must be involved. And it suggests that at a decision-making level, some things had gone very wrong. And one of the heartening things about the current government is that when um, the Prime Minister got COVID, he emphasised the value of his team, and that's not just a party political thing, that's actually part of responsible government, government and cabinet-based decision-making, is it's a collective, it's not an individual. Well, and that's why this was so needless, in a way. I mean, you're really shooting yourself in the foot, because either there was a good reason to do it, in which case the procedures are there to do it, you publicly announce it and say, we are protecting the community in this way, this was sensible and wise, um, or you don't do it, because it's frankly not needed. But uh, we're in a we're in a debate and a situation where things were done that just didn't need to happen. Many of these were dormant in any event. And it suggests, again, pretty basic problems with decision making, but also, I think, a lack of appreciation of how our system of government is meant to operate. And can I just add to that, the real problem here is precedent. Mm. Because in this particular case, he didn't actually exercise these powers except for once, OK, in relation to one portfolio. But what happens in the future when someone who does have dictatorial type um, uh, inclinations, inclinations um, says, hey, this has been done before. There is a way of doing this. It's OK. It's acceptable. And then goes in and starts taking over powers. I mean, this is a route we do not want to go down. And so that's why I think it's really important for people like us to 
um, be out there saying this is not just a, you know, blown up kerfuffle, you know, where we should instead be worrying about the cost of living, etc., etc. This is actually really important because we need to change two things. One is we need to change culture. We need to say, actually, this is a standard we do not accept so that future politicians understand that this kind of behaviour is not accepted. We need to definitely be clear about what our standards are. And the second thing is we need to put in those guardrails. We need to protect against it. So we need legislation um, to ensure that this type of thing can't happen in the future. Well, I think that's right. It shows convention and tradition only take you so far and that we can't rely upon it in this area. And once you create a precedent like this, people are going to use it. So we need to kill it. Even Morrison himself seemed to rely on his own precedent. What may have started as a COVID measure clearly morphed into a political exercise to override his resources minister. I want to close by noting that the Prime Minister claimed in the sense that overall good COVID management justified the means, that he didn't want to leave anything on the table. As public lawyers, we often, you know, have to answer that by saying that these basic norms really matter to not only the rule of law and our freedoms, but our prosperity. Um, And I think, Anna, it is really worth noting that we can do both. We can juggle. We We can can. look after the economy and uh, address basic public law norms. And you just have to look around the world and see what's happened to good governance and the rule of law when people take shortcuts and then eventually what happens to their economy as well. So I think could not agree more strongly about the need to make sure these issues are taken very seriously and that we see uh, an appreciation of the seriousness of the conduct as well as the reforms you suggest. Well, and I think that's right. I mean, yes, you can go to COVID management, but again, the bottom line is it wasn't needed for COVID management um, and it did damage. And part of COVID management is maintaining public trust. And the rule this of law. This undermines public trust. So it's it's it just is not justifiable on those criteria. And, uh, of course, there's been no evidence to show it's actually useful in any event. I mean, that's why this is so much of an own goal. This. I think redundancy, I mean, redundancy has to be built into the system. We should have built, bought more vaccines before we knew that they were... But I think the point um, is we had redundancy built in. Exactly. It's already there. And one of the things um, I want to draw people's attention to is how Anne explained that if anyone was sick, there were plenty of ways in which that could have been dealt with under orthodox procedures. I want to thank you all for joining us and particularly to George and Anne for sharing their expertise. No doubt the conversation will continue.